Welcome everyone to Law & Crime Daily. I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer. Pop star Britney Spears will not be deposed by her father's lawyer as an investigation of her now terminated conservatorship moves forward. Law & Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with what happened at the latest hearing. Anjanette? Brian, Britney Spears' father, Jamie, wanted her questioned by his lawyers, but Judge Brenda Penny reiterated that that is not going to happen as Spears' supporters gathered outside of the courthouse in Los Angeles. Lou, Lou, lock her up! Lou, Lou, lock her up! Now, Spears has alleged that her father, Jamie, created that conservatorship to control her life and enrich himself, and that her managers were a part of it. Those former managers, Lou Taylor and Robin Greenhill, have denied being a part of creating the conservatorship. But Spears' lawyer, Matthew Rosengart, presented the court with emails that suggested they were a part of it. Rosengart wants to depose both of them. He also spoke about Judge Penny's decision to not allow Jamie Spears' lawyers to depose Britney Spears. The decision was legally correct, but as a moral matter, it was correct. Britney obtained her freedom last November, and as many of you know, particularly perhaps in light of recent news, Britney is moving on with her life. She wants to move on with her life. And yet that man, her father, her flesh and blood, does not want that. The notion of her father, of all people, or any father, wanting to take a harassing deposition of their daughter, as I've said before, is morally abominable. Now, Matthew Rosengart said that Jamie Spears took at least $6.3 million from his daughter's estate, despite not being her manager or playing some other role. He, of course, was her conservator. He said that, you know, he hasn't alleged that that was illegal, but he's saying he hopes that uh, Jamie Spears hasn't squandered that money and he wanted to know who's paying his legal fees. Meanwhile, Jamie Spears will be deposed by August 12th, and there are still questions about whether or not that deposition will be filed with the court or possibly be subject to some type of protective order that would keep it sealed. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is legal analyst Melba Pearson and co-host Terry Austin. Melba, why do you think Jamie Spears wanted Brittany to pose? How would that have helped him in the end? I think that the reason why he wanted her to pose was to, number one, sort of flesh out this idea that he was acting in his own self-interest, that he was trying to enrich himself. He was hopefully going to try and get her to say something along the lines, or the attorney was going to try and get her to say something that either permission was given or that he was, that, that she was um, incapable of handling her affairs and trying to show, basically humiliate her in a lot of different ways to help build her case. And luckily, the judge saw through that. Yeah, speaking of seeing through it, Terry, the judge denied the motion filed by Jamie Spears to compel her, uh, her his daughter, sorry, her being uh, Brittany, to testify. Why do you think the judge ruled in her favor? Well, the judge didn't think it was necessary. She thought that Brittany's father, Jamie, was trying to harass Brittany. And basically, what Brittany's father was saying was that he wanted her to talk about how he might have mishandled her finances. But Brittany's team said it was a revenge deposition. She had no firsthand knowledge at all about the finances. That's why it was a conservatorship. And that going through such a deposition would really re-traumatize her. Judge Penny agreed. She said there's no need to do this. And in fact, Brian, the judge said there are other ways that you can get this information from other people, from documents, and not from Brittany. So let's not traumatize her. All right, let's explore those other ways, because Anjanette, Britney Spears is not being deposed, but what about her former manager? Well, Matthew Rosengart says those depositions, Brian, are coming. That was supposed to be discussed at this recent hearing, uh, but they ran out of time. The courthouse closed at 4.30, and uh, so they ran out of time because they were arguing about all of this other stuff. So TriStar is actually being ordered to produce all documents, and many of these documents will pertain to this alleged surveillance operation of Britney Spears. Now, um, this includes audio recordings and some monitoring of her text messages and 
and things like that from what we have been told. And the New York Times actually exposed this through a whistleblower. Others involved have denied it. Uh, but Matthew Rosengart said that this can this actually includes some audio recordings that include communications with Britney Spears and her lawyers, which would be a flagrant violation of attorney-client privilege. Absolutely. Well, we'll see how this story, the Britney Spears conservatorship, um, continues as more and more information seems to be coming out of this case. And Jeanette, thank you very much. Melvin Terry, we'll see you in a bit. The Parkland School shooter penalty phase trial is on hold until next week as a Florida jury will decide whether he receives life in prison or the death penalty. 17 people were killed and 17 more injured when the gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018. Last year, the shooter pled guilty to all counts of murder and attempted murder, prompting a penalty phase trial. After months of jury selection, opening statements were presented last week. Since then, dozens of survivors have taken the stand. The state is expected to rest its case sometime next week. For a complete recap of the trial's first two weeks, tune into the next episode of Law & Crime Daily. And in Las Vegas, a homeowner narrowly escapes a murder attempt, and it's all caught on on a ring doorbell camera. Law & Crime Network's correspondent, Sarah Gillespie, has the story. An attempted murder caught on video as ring doorbell footage captures a narrow escape. The footage released by the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department shows the man running across the street as a suspect chases close behind. Video then shows the man wearing a pink shirt run toward a gate. At the same time, the suspect, wearing what appears to be a white t-shirt, points a gun at the man. The dramatic video shows the suspect repeatedly pointing the gun to fire as it jams multiple times. After trying to shoot the man at least three times, the suspect runs off. Officials in Nevada now ask the public for help identifying this suspect, who they believe is a black man between 18 and 25 years old. They say the incident happened on July 24th near Lake Mead and Thomas W. Ryan Boulevard in Las Vegas. That's where the victim returned home and parked his car in the garage. After that, the suspect approached and, quote, demanded property. That's when the man ran off and the suspect followed close behind. Anyone with more information about this incident is asked to contact Crime Stoppers of Nevada. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie. Still ahead on Long Crime Daily, a one-time cult member shares her story about life inside Nexium. But first, the death of George Floyd. Two ex-Minnesota police officers are sentenced in federal court. Welcome back. Federal sentences are handed down for two ex-Minnesota officers involved in the death of George Floyd. Back in February, J. Alexander King and Tu Tao were convicted of violating Floyd's civil rights. The 46-year-old unarmed black man was killed in May of 2020 as ex-officer Derek Chauvin knelt on his neck for nine and a half minutes. King and Tao and Thomas Lane stood by as the incident occurred. On Wednesday, Tao was sentenced to three and a half years and King was sentenced to three years. Both are ordered to surrender themselves on or before October 4th. Federal prosecutors asked for a lesser sentence than Derek Chauvin, who received 21 years, but more than Thomas Lane, who was given two and a half years. Sentencing in this case could renew talks of a plea deal in King and Tao's state case. Both are charged with aiding and abetting murder and manslaughter. That case is expected to begin on October 24th. Terry, there were different sentences for each defendant. How do you think the judge calculated these sentences? Well, I think it was probably the correct calculation. All of them violated George Floyd's civil rights, but each one was distinct. Obviously, Derek Chauvin was primarily responsible. That's why he got the 21 years. I think Tao's sentence was three and a half years because he was on the force for eight years, and he completely completely ignored all the requests from that crowd, if you remember. And then I think King got the next number of two and a half years because he kept his knee on George Floyd's back, and that contributed to the death as well. I do think the judge gave Lane the less of all sentences because, remember, he was the one who said that he was concerned about delirium, and he said, please turn Floyd over. So I think that's why he got the lesser sentence. Yeah. I mean, King and 
lane makes sense to me, but I thought Tao would have gotten less because he literally had no hands on George Floyd, but hey, to each their own. But Melba, do you think these sentences will push King and Tao to trial or plea in their state cases? In my opinion, I think that they're going to be more likely to want to take a plea in the state case, especially if they can work out a situation where the sentences could be served concurrently. If it ends up being that it would have to be a consecutive sentence, meaning they either have to finish their federal sentence first and then go to the state, then it would be less likely that a plea could be negotiated. But I think because of the fact that they're already going to go into custody, their career as a police officer is completely over, it is highly likely that plea negotiations will really go into high gear at this point. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if the prosecution comes back and says, you know what, six years, we're not negotiating at all, or if they do what you say, fall in line with the federal charges as well. Well, in Houston, Texas, a shocking road rage incident caught on camera when a woman fires a gun near a two-year-old boy. Law and Crime Network correspondent Sierra Gillespie has the story. A road rage incident caught on camera as a woman allegedly fires a gun into a vehicle where a toddler was seated. Oh. It happened on July 26th on Interstate 45 in Houston, Texas. Sheriff Ed Gonzalez says two vehicles were driving north when they came to a stop. That's when a man and woman got out of their truck and approached another man in his car. The victim says the man, later identified as 34-year-old Benjamin Green, assaulted him. Sheriff Gonzalez says that as the man tried to drive off, the female suspect, 40-year-old Nasley Ortiz, fired a gun into the back seat through the passenger window. The victim says his two-year-old son was seated in the back of the vehicle at the time. Oh! The victim was taken to the hospital with a possible graze wound. Sheriff Gonzalez says both Ortiz and Green were arrested and now face assault charges. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, a look inside the Nexium cult. A former member describes meeting the infamous Keith Raniere. Plus, the Alex Jones defamation trial. We take you inside the courtroom for a heated exchange. Welcome back. We're taking a closer look now at the so-called Nexium cult that made headlines in early 2018 when its leader, Keith Raniere, was arrested on counts of sex crimes and forced labor. Law and Crime Network Sierra Gillespie hears from a Nexium cult survivor now working to prevent others from a similar experience. In the very beginning, um, it was really hard for me to say that, that I was in a cult. It was very hard for me to even wrap my head around it. But now, now these days, yes, I was in a cult. Kelly Teal says it's no one's intention to join a cult. But years after her involvement with Nexium, she's still picking up the pieces. I don't know how far I would have gone. I don't know if I had said yes and given collateral and then found out the next level of what was going on, what would I have done? If I had found the next level after that of being branded, would I, would I have run out screaming? Now associated with secret societies, blackmail, body branding, and the infamous Keith Raniere, Teal says her experience with Nexium started much differently. They had this promise and this mission of purpose in the world. I jumped right in. I thought, this is this is the answer. This is just going to be the answer. It has to be the answer. In winter 2016, Teal stumbled upon Nexium's executive success program. But by chance, her first experience with cults occurred nearly 20 years before. I used to live across the like small canyon from Heaven's Gate when that happened. But to her, Nexium didn't relate to Heaven's Gate at all. There was nothing cultish about it going into it. In the 18 months she was involved with the organization, Teal says she met leader Keith Raniere, who she says embodied a superstar type energy. When I met him, my first reaction was sort of like, he's short, kind of nerdy looking. And it was very kind of awkward. He asked me a few questions. He said he knew all about me and that I was doing great within, within the coursework. Now, over time, you start to kind of buy this idea that he's special. Like everybody sort of put him on this pedestal. Do you know what I'm going to say right now? 
You're insecure about that. Yeah. Is that scary for you? No. Why not? Because I trust that what you're going to say is going to be good. And, be and in the end, you're going to be okay. I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. In 2019, Ranieri was convicted of a string of federal crimes, including sex trafficking of children and conspiracy. By 2020, he was sentenced to 120 years in prison. Follower Allison Mack of Smallville fame was also sentenced to three years in prison. I did have a moment that was a wash from my right side all the way over to my left side that went through my body that was like this opening that just said, Keith is evil. Ranieri, known as Vanguard to his followers, created the Nexium self-help program in the 1990s, eventually masterminding the secret society called DOS. What appeared to be a women's self-empowerment group was really a front for creating sex slaves. When I saw that these slaves were giving the collateral, that word jumped off the page to me. And that's when I started putting two and two together. Teal says she was recruited to join DOS, but later learned Ranieri spearheaded the group. It required women to provide collateral on entry and brand themselves with Ranieri's initials. I'm probably going to get flack on this, but they were good people. Allison Mack, I don't believe, was a bad person. She did bad things, and she's paying for that now. I believe that many of the people that are, are um, were involved at the higher levels were manipulated to some extent. In the years following her experience with Nexium, Teal now works to bring awareness to the prevalence of cults in America. There is no one person or one thing out there in the world that has the answer. It's inside. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie. For more information about Teal's story or for cult support resources, visit the website on your screen. When we come back, we head to Texas for the Alex Jones defamation trial. What happens when an argument breaks out between attorneys from both sides? That's ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. Things get heated between attorneys in the Sandy Hook school shooting civil trial in Texas as a family of one of the victims sues conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. In December 2012, a gunman killed 20 first grade students and six staff members at a Connecticut school. After the shooting, Jones told his audience it was a hoax and that he thought it was staged with actors in order to push gun control measures. The families of several victims and an FBI agent who responded to the incident filed lawsuits against the political conspiracy theorists over his comments. Courts in both Texas and Connecticut have already found Jones liable for defamation, entering default judgment against Jones after he ignored several court orders and failing to respond to discovery demands ahead of trial. An Austin jury will determine what Jones will pay in damages in his first lawsuit trial. Jones later said he believes the shooting did happen, but claims he has a right to say that it didn't. Toward the end of the day Wednesday and after testimony was done for the day, things got heated between both sides' attorneys. And Nina, will you talk to me? How about you talk to me? Will you talk to me? We said in that hallway, you said to me, are all your videos I said this is a summary exhibit and we're agreeing to all this. Hey guys, maybe now's not the time. Maybe we can cool off and I'm going to have a phone call later. Okay, yeah, sounds like a good idea. Okay. Can I talk to you for a second? Uh, Anything you're going to say to me. No, no, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, that way you can tell him, and then we're not going to have a fight, and it'll be easy. Do, Mark, do you have his phone number? I don't have his phone number. We're phone. having a fight okay. right now. Write your phone number down so we can get it, and we'll call you after everybody cools down a little bit on both sides. I think we'll buy him. Exactly, which is why I tried to get you both. No, you can give me your phone number, Federico. I don't want to talk to you anymore right now. Give me your phone number. Write it down, and we'll give you a phone I'll text it to you. Melba, what? I'm sorry, it's like two grown men. I'm not sure if they're grown men at that point, but Melba, what's your reaction to these attorneys and their conduct about the omission of videos? It's very disappointing and I dare say disgusting uh, because basically you shouldn't be getting into, you know, peeing matches, <laughs> not to be, you know, whatever, in the middle of court. Like, you have to have some decorum. You have to have respect for the process. And, of course, you're both going to zealously represent your client, but, you know, at the same token, you have to do so 
it with decorum and in accordance with you know the oath of office that we swore as an attorney to uphold the law and to not bring any disreputable actions or or a bad look upon our profession and what they did there was a very bad look and unnecessary well we'll see what happens when those two boys are out of their time out um jones uh, Terry, Jones has two default judgments filed against him. Why do you think he chose to ignore court orders in two different states? You know what, Brian? It was really not a strategic move on his part, and that's putting it mildly. It was really an idiotic move. He failed to respond to the complaint in Connecticut, and in Texas, he didn't respond to discovery orders. So both judges said, listen, you're liable, and we're going to go straight to damages. So I think that it made no sense for him because now he cannot argue any First Amendment rights. He's already been deemed liable for the case. And the only thing remaining now is a question of how much. He's asked for a dollar against him. And of course, we know that the plaintiffs are asking for $100 million in, $150 million in Texas. And I think he really should have tried to defend the case. I think the uh, amount is going to be closer to $150 million. You know, see how it plays out. Well, Melba, Terry, thank you. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.